Hi, Sorush. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, today, my guest is Sorush Sagafian. He's an associate professor at Harvard University. His current research focuses on the application and development of OR methods in studying stochastic systems with specific applications in healthcare and operations management. He's the founder and director of the Public Impact Analytics Science Lab at Harvard, which is devoted to advancing and applying the science of analytics for solving societal problems that can have public impact. Soder serves on the editorial board of a few journals, including OR, Production and Operations Management, Informed Service Science, and IISC Transactions. He also serves as an associate editor or referee for several other OR journals. He received many awards and achieved many accomplishments throughout his career, and you can find a complete list on his website. His current teaching focuses on machine learning and related analytical tools for solving societal problems. Surush, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It's, um, you know, it's a great honor to have you here. How are you? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here and talk to you. Yeah. Uh, so from which part of Iran are you from? So I was born in Isfahan, which is the suburb of Isfahan, which is like the second uh, largest city in Iran. Um, but then I went to Tehran to do uh, most of my grad studies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you were born short after the Iranian Revolution, and you grew up during the Iran-Iraq War. It should have been tough for you, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so um, as a kid, I have a lot of memories of of, of war. Um, my first grade was actually, you know, canceled because of the war. The, the, you know, the government decided that it's not safe for us to go to school. And then even after you know schools opened, uh, I remember we had like you know underground shelters in the schools. So a lot of times, you know, we would hear the siren in the middle of a of a class or something, and then you know you would you, you would go to to shelter underground, and you know you would stay there for three hours, four hours, uh, and until you know it's safe, and then you would come back to to the school. Yeah, so I have a lot of memories of of uh war yeah yeah uh but the schools uh were closed uh when you were studying for a year or two or for six months yeah so i think the first grade you know was closed i'm very grateful to my first grade teacher because uh she agreed uh for me to go to her house occasionally mm -hmm. and so that i can continue learning um and uh but then it opened afterwards but it was like you know a lot of like um interruptions uh so you know you would be like in in a class and you're reading something and then all of a sudden you know the siren goes on and you have to leave and maybe you know they say oh the next day is not safe for you to come back so a lot of on and off i would say <clears throat> yeah um and how did you keep yourself busy back then and yeah, so, you know, I think, you know, we had uh, really dedicated teachers, I would say, you know, uh, I, I said, like, you know, the first grade teacher, like, agreed for us to go to her house, um, so we can continue learning. But, um, you know, it, it was a tough period for a lot of people. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad we got, <laughs> you know, that the war ended at some point, you know. Yeah. Uh, did you have any particular interest, uh, you know, during childhood and teenage years, uh, you know, music, sports? Yeah, so I, I, I you know, started uh, loving tennis. And so I'm a huge fan of tennis and I've been playing uh, since I was a kid. Uh, so I love that sport. I remember like going after school, uh, going just watching people who are playing. Um, and, you know, I learned that way. I couldn't like at that point, uh, tennis was very expensive. So we didn't afford to like go to like, you know, take classes mm -hmm. and things like that. So I learned by just watching people play. Remember a lot of times after school, I would just go and spend time watching people, what they do, uh, things like that. But I love tennis. I still, um, you know, play tennis, but I did some other sports as well. You know, I picked up uh, basketball. Uh, we used to play soccer all the time. Uh, volleyball was uh, one of the favorite sports. I still love volleyball, play occasionally. Um, yeah, so a lot of a lot of sports. I, I love sports. I still love sports. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, any favorite tennis player back then? 
Yeah, so I, you know, at that point, I I, I loved uh, Sampras, I um, uh, Edberg first, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I uh, borrowed uh, Edberg's uh, racket, tennis racket, not his racket, but mm -hmm. you know, he had a brand of racket, mm -hmm. and so I I, I picked up because he, I I loved this the, his style of playing. You know, he would approach the net a lot, and I loved like serve playing. and volley, right? Yes, yeah, serve and volley a yeah, lot. And I remember I loved that, and then you know, afterwards. Sampras came, and so he was my favorite. And then, of course, uh, the Roger Federer is the is the, is the all time uh, best for me. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that uh, you, you, both Edberg and uh, Sampras they they like uh, serve and volley. Yeah, that's my style of playing too. And I, you know, I always like uh, was in my head thinking of why people, you know, do not approach uh, enough. I, I still think like people are not utilizing that um, option enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what I love. Yeah, yeah. I remember Patrick Rafter used to do that. Uh, yeah, Patrick Rafter was very famous for like you know having a really good serve and volley, yeah. which is which is difficult. But I think it's a very good good tactic to like you know, yeah. uh, especially end the points um, early, uh -huh. so you don't like you know use a lot of energy. So it's yeah. in terms of energy saving, I think that's uh, that's a very good uh, yeah. tactic. So uh, I noticed in your website that you have a great admiration for the great John von Neumann. Uh, that, did that start when you were still in Iran? Yeah, so I started, uh, you know, when you, so I, th I think what I love about uh, John uh, and, and I mean, the way he, his friends called him Johnny, <laughs> uh, Johnny Van Neumann was that he was great in uh, a lot of different um, areas. So, you know, when you study, um, of course, you know, when you study utility theory, you, you learn about his work, you study quantum mechanics, you learn about his work, you go to chemistry, he has theories there, uh, you go to graph theory, you know, he has um, results there. And all of the results, I mean, it's interesting that all of the results are very inspiring and very innovative. Um, so I learned a lot about him. And then, of course, I started reading some um, really good books uh, about him. Uh, so there's one by uh, Norman McNorrow. And th the book is really good because it depicts how good of a scholar he is. And for me, you know, we have a lot of obviously, you know, a, lo a lot of people who are good in like dedicated areas and very, I would say, narrow areas. Uh, for me, that's not a scholar. So what I uh, love about um, him John Van Neumann was that he was very broad and so he could think um, out of the box, he could think a lot about of different, you know, sciences, connect them together. And that's what I, I call a scholar. I, I don't think you can be a scholar by just knowing, you know, one area really good. And doesn't matter what it is, you know, you, you might be really good in physics and you may even win the Nobel Prize in physics for, for a small thing. But as long as you don't know, you know, different areas and you can't connect you know different areas you can't see out of the box a little bit the bigger picture uh for me personally um i wouldn't you know i wouldn't call you a scholar right uh and uh he was a renaissance man in a way right he was yep. all over the place and his contributions were absolutely amazing and regardless of what field he studied he he somewhat made you know very important contributions to really advance in that particular field. Um, so how did you choose uh, the career to follow? Uh, so, you know, my career was, you know, I was always interested in uh, sort of thinking about solving problems in starting, you know, in, in high school, I always loved math. Um, and I, you know, uh, try to use, you know, all the mathematical tools that are out there to solve problems. And I think I'm still doing the same thing. So, you know, the lab that I've um, founded and I'm directing is all about using the analytical tools that are out there, uh, not only advancing them, but also importantly, trying to use them to have a public impact. And that's what I, you know, um, aspire to do. Uh, and I think a lot of, you know, tools that I've learned in, in operations research, in statistics, in uh, mathematics and related fields, they are really good for, um, you know, having a public impact. 
and uh, that's what I, you know, have been always trying to do. Have been trying to uh, advance these techniques, but also try to advance them in a direction that they become useful for, you know, solving uh, problems that can have public impact. So you think pursuing a major in industrial engineering uh, back in Iran could be the beginning of that journey? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I knew that. You know, you could study operations research uh, if you go to industrial engineering programs. And um, I, you know, I fell in love with operations research. I still um, love it, of course. And, uh, you know, I think I think uh, the reason I love it is because I, I know that it can have a lot of impact on uh, solving some of the problems that, you know, the, they have big impact, but people have been haven't been able to, like, you know, address them. Yeah, that's great to hear. Uh, so you were familiar with OR uh, before joining the university, am I correct? That's right. So a little bit, you know, in, in um, high, high school, essentially, we learned, we learned uh, mathematics and, you know, we, our, grad, our education in math uh, was really good. But I also, you know, studied a lot of uh, more advanced books when I was in high school. Uh, books that sometimes here when you go to a master program in mathematics, you, you know, people study reading them. I studied reading them in high school. And so I was very intrigued by, um, you know, those techniques. And then I realized that uh, my mind is also a little bit applied. So I'm not in um, abstract. I'm not that much in love with abstract mathematics compared to like, you know, sort of uh, applied versions of mathematics. And so OR was, I think, a perfect uh, fit for me. Yeah, that's uh, rather unusual for one to, to be aware of uh, the, the OR methods and the, the, the field in general uh, prior to university. And uh, I think, uh, was it that common in Iran or in, at least in, uh, no, in the environment? Yeah. No, I wouldn't say it was that common. And it, it wasn't like I was completely aware of like, you know, all the contributions in OR and completely knowing what it is before going to, um, before studying uh, university. Uh, but I, I knew enough that it's, you know, it's part of applied mathematics and it's used a lot for, you know, solving, solving applied problems. And so that's what I, you know, I knew and I, that's one of the reasons why I, I followed it. Okay. Uh, you wrote your first journal paper still as an undergraduate student, which is very impressive. Uh, how did you choose the topic and how did you carry out uh, research uh, with limited access to international papers and so on? Yeah, so the, the topic, I uh, I learned about it while I was taking a class. And so the subject of that paper is on sort of the algorithms that were available uh, to solve uh, scheduling problems and specifically flow shop uh, problems. I narrowed it down to specific sets of criteria which are called mix band criteria and i try to uh, sort of advance the algorithms that are out there for sequencing uh, jobs and it had a lot of applications um, obviously you know um, in production systems but also in computer science uh, a lot of applications for how processors you know um, schedule uh, tasks and prioritize tasks but also now in, in service, the, those techniques are used a lot for prioritizing customers, for prioritizing if you go to healthcare, for prioritizing uh, patients. And so I started reading a lot of papers uh, um, at that point. I um, started uh, collecting uh, journal papers that were written on that subject, and that subject was wide by then. Uh, I remember I collected about um, 350 papers that were uh, I thought they were most influential papers written on that subject. And I, you know, spent a lot of time reading them one by one. Um, and then, you know, when once I realized that I have enough knowledge to, to write a new paper and sort of contribute to that area, I started doing that. Yep. Wow. 350 papers. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, I realized that like I couldn't I couldn't contribute without knowing all those papers. And so I, I had to read them. Yeah. So actually, I, I mentioned that you had limited access. That's not true because you somewhat uh, were able well, to. We had 
we had access to to internet uh, and uh, it was difficult but I again like we could we could collect the papers through internet at that point uh, it wasn't as easy as it is today so I had mm -hmm. to, to go to the library you know spend a lot of time trying to access papers a lot of papers you know you couldn't access it earlier you know uh, easy so you had to go and talk to the librarian librarian had to you know get approval from university and you know come back to you it's, it's not as easy as it is these days of like you know uh, and especially i was in iran so mm -hmm. you, you know a lot of uh, limitations uh, back then internet was actually um, starting uh, it wasn't a common thing um, so it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was possible. Yeah, we're talking about late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, this That's period. right, yeah. yeah. You also wrote another paper uh, related to fuzzy theory in decision making. Yeah, so uh, th th that was sort of my uh, second paper that I wrote. And I, that was because I was really interested in uh, decision making and how people uh, do decision making in in uh, uncertain environment, and that's one of the subjects I'm still uh, working on. Uh, and in that paper, what I did was trying to think about sort of the most common decision making problems or or environments. This is common, uh, and this is the problem where you have a group of people, you know, trying to make a decision. So you know, for hiring faculty members, for instance, there's a group. For admission decisions to universities, there's there's a committee that tries to make admission decisions. Um, in companies, there's always you know a board or 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 a committee. Um, everything you know when there's decision making, most likely there is a committee that is making decisions. And even you, when you go to Congress and and uh, other parts of the government, the decision making is really you know personal. Uh, it's more you have a group. And what is interesting is that the group have different uh, views, different preferences, and you know, so some people will uh, weight things more than the other. So one important aspect is that there is a group, but the second important aspect is that there are many cri many criteria, right? It's not that you know when you are hiring a faculty member, it's not like you only t you know think about their researchability. That's that's just one of the things you think about their teaching. You know the service are they going to be good members of the community are they going to like advance the mission of mission of the school um in you know different things admissions for phd programs for instance you know we care about you know the researchability of that person their background you know we care about their personality even sometimes we care about their recommendation letters their grades all sort of things so there's a lot of criteria and people view them differently you know you you may think that oh you know, the grades are more important uh, than other aspects. I may think that, you know, if that person has a CV, we shouldn't, has a published paper, we shouldn't think about, you know, their grades. Uh, so people have different views about the criteria, the objective function, right? So how do you make decisions when there's a group and everybody has a different, you know, sort of objective function? Um, so people, I realized at that point, and I'm, I'm still, I'm talking about when I was in undergrad, I, 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 I understood that people have been trying to solve that in what they call it in a probabilistic view uh, is that people assign probabilities to those things and then you try to sort of come up with the uh, some sort of a, a utility or a score for each person given those probabilities right mm -hmm. um, and that was the the common view of you know in most settings in decision making as you know we assign probabilities and then we try to we have an objective function which sort of uses those probabilities yeah right, right yeah um i realized that assigning those probabilities is almost impossible right so a lot of times you know people say oh you know the probability for this is 0.99 or or, or 0.7 but those are not exact numbers right mm -hmm. and so assigning probabilities um, is very difficult. If I give you two uh, candidates, let's say for PhD um, admissions, and I ask you, okay, so what is the probability that this person uh, is better than this person in terms of like, you know, the researchability, mm -hmm. right? It's very hard for you to give me an exact probability. You may say, well, I think it's probably somewhere between 70 to 80%. You know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you can't give me an exact probability. Yeah. So I, I didn't like that approach of assigning probabilities, um, e exact probabilities at least. And so um, at that point, I started uh, thinking about 
what can we do differently? And I studied fuzzy theory, which was a good option to, to do this, but it had limitations and I think it still it has limitations. So I tried to a little bit lift the limitations there and combine it with other sort of multi-criteria decision methods, especially, you know, things like topsis that have been very successful, uh, but remove the fact that, you know, you, you need either deterministic or probabilistic scores and uh, try to move them towards using fuzzy numbers. But again, you know, fuzzy numbers had problems and I tried to like, you know, remove that. So that's sort of the subject of of that paper, which is something that I'm still <laughs> working on. Mm -hmm. And I have moved it more towards decision making under ambiguity. And that's one of the areas that I've been uh, working and I've uh, published more papers recently on sort of decision making under ambiguities where um, I think I have found some solutions for, for this type of problems that I mentioned. Yeah, that's super impressive. Uh, you were studying combinatorial optimization problems and then uh, multi-criteria decision making. You know, uh, that's in everything uh, during the undergrad. That's, that's amazing. Uh, but once you got a degree, uh, did you go straight to the masters or did you have to do any type of military service, which is common in Iran? Yeah, so the military service, uh, if you are not essentially studying, you have to start the military service. I, after I uh, uh, finished my undergrad, I was accepted. We had to, to um, participate in a national exam uh, to get to grad schools. So everybody has to go through the national exam. Um, and uh, I, you know, participate that. I had a very good ranking. I was ranked number nine in wow. the country and so i could choose sort of the program that i wanted i decided to go to sharif university to study or more carefully and mm -hmm. um that's what i did and so because of that i didn't need to do military service at that point because i was in the still studying master program immediately after i finished i got to the master's program mm -hmm. so i did that and then fortunately after my master's in, in the master program, I was, um, you know, I had the highest GPA. And so I was fortunate to get to the PhD program without any exam. So I was exempted from uh, any exam to get to the PhD program because I had the highest GPA in Sharif University. And so um, I got to the PhD program, but um, after um, sort of the PhD program, you have to, you have to do military service. Oh. so. You know, with the military program, as long as you're studying, you know, you don't need to do military because you have, you know, sort of, you can say, I'm, I'm in the university, I can be also in the military at the same time. But it's under the understanding that you have to do that when, when you finish. Or if you want to leave the country, for instance, you have to do the military before you leave the country. Uh, so I, after my master's, again, immediately I got to, to the PhD program, but uh, when I finished all the courses in the PhD program, I decided that I need to, you know, learn more and go to maybe um, a, a environment which I can learn more. So I started thinking about applying to the PhD programs in top PhD programs in the U.S. Uh, but to to be able to attend those programs, you have to do the military service. Um, so I was like, well, it's, it's two years of just, you know, doing service. Uh, I was uh, fortunate because there was a rule, um, at least back then, that if you are the only child of, uh, of the family and your dad is older than uh, a threshold, you become sort of responsible for your family. And in that case, you can apply to be exempted from the military service. And so I got uh, exemption because of that rule, because my dad was um, older than the threshold than, that they have, and I was the only child. Um, and so I was exempted from the military mm -hmm. Can you briefly comment, uh, what did you study during your master's? Yeah, so during the master's, I, I moved a little bit towards sort of using operations research techniques for supply chain. Uh, for supply chain optimization using, um, you know, sort of networks and how do you, how do you optimize networks of uh, suppliers and optimize their logistic issues, transportation, uh, other things that, you know, um, are within a supply chain uh, network. How do you design the supply chain was my, my main uh, sort of uh, area that I focused during my master's program. 
and uh, that's what I mainly study. So a lot of network optimization, a lot of supply chain management, supply chain optimization, transportation, those type of things that are important within the supply chain. Right. Uh, and when you're doing your PhD, uh, you were really busy with multiple activities. Uh, can you summarize yeah, so some I, of them? <laughs> yeah, so I needed to make money. And uh, what I did, I loved teaching as well. So I got uh, some uh, teaching positions. I was uh, essentially, I became a lecturer in uh, different universities. And uh, I also started working uh, in a company which was doing research uh, related to uh, improving sort of the um, railroad transportation and optimizing railroads, things like that. So I was involved in that company as well, just trying to um, help them do more research. But in terms of teaching, it was like my main activity was, was teaching. So I was a PhD student teaching and also working uh, on the company just to make some money because things are expensive, as you know. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the universities, I remember, was uh, far from, so I was studying in Shaif University, which was in Tehran. One of the universities was uh, about five hours, uh, you know, driving. And so I had to I had to teach 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. in that university, but I was, you know, in Tehran. So we had the university would send me a cab driver. The cab driver would pick me up at 2 a.m. and wow. we would drive. We would drive to that university. I would, you know, get there around 7:30, get ready for teaching at 8 o'clock. I would start teaching 8 to 5, and then you know the driver would come and pick me up and take me back to Tehran again. Another five hours, the same day. So I would get to bed like you know midnight. So I had long days but uh, I, I love teaching and um, you know that's uh, how my sort of PhD yeah. life was yeah 10 hours on the road and that should be being super tiring uh, yeah. yeah but you mentioned that uh, at some point you decided to to leave and apply to to uh, universities uh, in North America uh, how was the process of applying and also uh, could you comment on the challenges of, you know, uh, yeah. getting a visa and gr going through TOEFL and GRE yeah. and so on? Yeah, so the process uh, back then was, was very challenging um, in multiple ways. One main issue was that, well, we didn't uh, still, you know, Iran doesn't have any diplomatic relationship uh, with the U.S. So, you know, even even if you know that you're going to get admission from your dream university, you, you don't know if you're going to get be able to get visa to come back. But even before that, there are several challenges. Um, and, you know, we didn't have a place to take the GRE exam. We didn't have a place to take TOEFL exam. For each of them, you have to go to a different country, uh, which is obviously very expensive for, for a student to do. Um, a lot of challenges around there. Um, there wasn't any people that you know could tell me what are this university is looking for. How do you write an SOP? How do you you know prepare your documents? You know how do you apply? Even like you know to pay the the, the admission fees for this universities. I mean we don't we didn't have credit cards. I mean you know um, so it it wasn't at all clear how you pay for this admission things. And so I even that simple thing of paying for the admission fee is not is not an <laughs> easy thing to do yeah. um but so i i started applying and you know trying to to do my best in applying to top universities and i applied and i was um you know um happy and lucky that i got to uh, one of the top programs in industrial engineering in university of michigan and so I got the admission, uh, but you know I got the admission still not knowing that I can go or, or, or I can't go. So you have to now take the admission documents to an embassy. If you're lucky, uh, you would get an appointment in an embassy that is in a different country, not your own country. Yeah, you have to arrange travels to there. So you have to figure out how to get an appointment first of all. Well, you know, it's very difficult to get an appointment. <laughs> um you get the appointment then you have to arrange travels you know you have to make sure you have all the documents so you go through the interview and you know even after the interview you don't know uh, so you have to just wait and i waited and i waited and i didn't hear and so i was getting close to 
the time where you know the university wanted me to start and I still didn't didn't have my visa uh, and so I informed the universities I said look I, I, I don't have my visa I don't know what to do and so my you know uh, advisor professor there um and some other people in the university that started talking to like you know writing to the embassy and i don't think they heard back <laughs> anything uh, anyway so I, at some point my visa came and they said okay you have to come pick it up and so you know you have to be like really flexible get a flight the other day just to go pick it up mm-hmm. uh, and when i got the visa i came to the u.s i was late um right and, you also know, for started, toefl and gre you you had to go elsewhere yeah, even as I said, like, you know, for TOEFL and GRE, you had to go to a different country. First of all, you have to study for them. It's not a common thing. So, no, you know, uh, you have to learn how to study for them. Uh, but, you know, then you have to arrange going to a different country again, like, you know, trying to take those exams, making sure that you do a good job on the exams. You know, these are all, like, uh, challenges that are... Uh, for at least for for Iranians at that point, and I'm sure they are still there, and also for people from other countries, I'm sure there are similar challenges as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you so you arrived one month late uh, to yeah. start your PhD. Uh, was it easy for you to to adjust? You know, new country, uh, different culture, and so on. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, it, it, I don't think it was easy. First of all you know you arrive there you, i mean my language wasn't that good um so there's a lot of you know language challenges i mean you haven't you know spoken that language for a long time i mean for your whole life essentially and now you're in a new country where everybody's talking in a different language you don't know how things work which is one of the main challenges um i remember for instance i wanted to get a cell phone to be able to make phone calls and even to do that, you needed to have other documents, you know, they needed uh, social security uh, number and things like that. And so then I'm like, okay, so how do I get social security number? And so I have to go learn how you get social security number. And then they say, okay, you know, need a bank account. So, you know, your university can pay you for your RA work. So how do you like, you know, in your own country, you know how things work, you know, you know how the bank works and things like that, what the documents the bank wants. When you go to a new immigrate to a new country, um, you, you have to learn all those things from scratch, and so these are the challenges. I even remember because I was late. The first thing the university asked me essentially was, uh, as, you know, they said welcome, but you you owe that university housing, you know, five hundred dollars, which was a lot of money at that point. Uh-huh. And it was because I was one month late, uh-huh. but they wanted me to pay for the for the rent uh-huh. of. The time I wasn't there, and I was like saying, "Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't in the university housing. I just drived. Why uh-huh. should I pay for the time I wasn't here?" But that was they said, "Oh, it was it's in the contract and things like that." So I had to pay, you know, <laughs> uh, for a month that I didn't use university housing. You still have to pay. So a lot of I mean, uh, Im- immigration and especially I think you know first generation immigration uh, is 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 very challenging. Yeah. Uh, and during your PhD, you found time to to get a master's in math. Uh, that was part of the plan. Uh, it, uh, not not immediately. So I got admitted to the to the OR program, the civil engineering program, essentially. Uh, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I always loved mathematics, and so I started taking a lot of courses in mathematics. Um, and then I was thinking of doing a PhD in mathematics um, in parallel to my PhD in engineering. So I took all the classes wow. that were there. Uh, but then, you know, when it comes to writing a dissertation, um, they wanted us, you know, they wanted people, there, it wasn't a joint program. So you had to, you know, publish in math journals separately mm-hmm. for the dissertation if you want to write a dissertation in math. And for the engineering program, um, you know, obviously there are different requirements. You have to write different dissertation, publish in different journals, um, things like that. So I decided that um, it's it's best for me to just uh, you know get a master and not continue the uh, PhD program in, in mathematics. Um, right. Although I had taken a lot of mm-hmm. courses in mathematics, so right. um, that's that's essentially what yeah. I did. So tell me about your PhD research on helping emergency rooms to enable doctors to see patients faster. Yeah, so I, I, when I was in the PhD program, again, one of the 
main sort of research that I did and was a large part of my dissertation was trying to help emergency rooms because I um, studied the problem and I realized a lot of people die unfortunately uh, because of how bad things are in the emergency rooms in the US. Uh, people go, they wait for a long time. Uh, the doctors can't see them immediately and these are by definition, these are emergent, you know, emergency room patients. You don't go to emergency room uh, unless you know there's something serious emergency um, happening going for you. Uh, so unfortunately, I looked at the statistics. I realized a lot of people are dying in emergency rooms just because of waiting. Uh, I realized if we could, you know, do something so that the doctors can get to the patients faster, uh, minimize their waiting times, we can save a lot of uh, a lot of time. So one of the main issues in emergency rooms in a lot of countries, and specifically in the U.S., is called overcrowding, where you know the capacity compared to demand is not. Um, is not good so people end up waiting and you know we can't we can't hire more physicians because physicians are you know expensive you can't add beds you know to add beds there are several regulations government regulations you have to go so it's not that you can you can increase capacity to, to do that uh, so i thought that this is a very familiar problem we have you know we have limited capacity and you want to optimize that limited capacity um, to serve people in a better way. And that's, you know, that's what the OR is about. So I started thinking about, okay, so how, how can we do that, given that we have this limited capacity and we can't lift it in, in emergency rooms? Um, how, do you, how do you change the protocols? How do you come up with new policies, with new uh, ways of prioritizing patients, with better ways of moving the patients through the emergency room and um, through the hospital as well? Uh, and I used a lot of optimization techniques to do that. Yeah, uh, I assume you use some stochastic approaches like um, yeah, QE so, theory, Markov chains, and so on. Yeah, exactly. So I did a lot of um, uh, analysis in the stochastic networks and queuing networks, essentially, and um, tried to, to, to do a lot of modeling in uh, modeling those networks, sometimes using Markov decision processes to optimize the decisions that would improve the performance of those models, uh, of those networks. Um, I did a lot of simulation, what mm. we call high fidelity simulation, trying to uh, make sure that you um, model essentially the system in a high fidelity way, because there are tons of things going on uh, where you know you have the nurses picking up the phone, answering something, you have the doctor being busy with like entering in the system, you have IT people trying to sometimes help physicians figure out things. You know, there's tons of things going on in, in a real world environment. Um, and uh, I needed to do this sort of simulation analysis as well, just to make sure that we can simulate uh, how patients move through the emergency departments and come up with the best decisions so we can uh, improve the system. Right. Did you use any tool or did you call yourself the, the simulator? Yeah, so I realized that with the software that were available, um, you didn't have the ability to be fully flexible in the sense that you want to include all these things that are going on in the emergency room. And it's very hard for uh, to use those software to, to model this thing. So I started using C++, which allowed me to write from scratch. Um, and uh, I, I wrote a lot of uh, lines in uh, C++, a lot of codes in C++ to be able to simulate in a sort of accurate way and in a, in a detailed way uh, what's happening in the emergency rooms and tr try to therefore um, compare different rules, different policies, see what works, what doesn't work and things like that. Yeah, acquiring uh, data uh, can be really complicated. Uh, and how did you do it in your case? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the challenges that we, we had was that, you know, hospitals collect a lot of data, but those that data is mainly for insurance purposes, unfortunately. So all the IT systems in hospitals and things like that are mainly for billing, for insurance, you know. Uh, we didn't have operational data. You don't know how physicians are spending their time, but that's very important because uh, if you know how physicians are spending their time, then you can do a lot of things. You can you can change things, or if you can't change, you at least know what's going on, what are the limitations and things like that. So unfortunately, you know, from the hospital IT system, there's no data 
about how physicians or nurses or other people are spending their time. You know, like, you know, the billing codes and things like yeah. that or, or things about the, the medical side of things, but you don't have, you know, time related things or operational essentially variables. Um, so what I had to do, what, we had to collect those things. So I was like, well, this is very challenging to do. Uh, what I decided to do was to form a team and we developed this iPhone applications and we put the, uh, the applications on the phones and we gave the phones to to the physicians so they could time themselves. So they would say, you know, I'm starting right now. I'm seeing, you know, Saroosh. Now I'm done with Saroosh. I have to now go see, uh, you know, Alex. Now I'm done with Alex. I'm ordering a CT scan for Alex. I'm, you know, so right. that gave us a lot of data, detailed data about how the physicians are actually spending their time. Mm -hmm. Um, and what did you do after completing your PhD? I'm skipping all the awards you got, you know, because that's just too yeah. many. <laughs> yeah. No, after, uh, yeah, after I finished my uh, PhD, I was, you know, interested to, to collaborate with Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is one of the leading healthcare systems in the US, and they were doing a lot of research related to the things I was doing. So I was, you know, interested to, to, to help them collaborate with them, but I also wanted to do you want to have an academic job? And so what worked for me was um, I went to, um, to Arizona State University where I was in the OR and computer science department, but I was also very close to the Mayo Clinic. One of the main branches of Mayo Clinic is now uh, was at Phoenix as in he's now still in Phoenix. So I was very close to them. I could, you know, collaborate with the doctors in, in the Mayo Clinic, but also, you know, um, do the things I like about, you know, teaching and doing research, uh, be with people um, and uh, be in industrial engineering or, or computer science um, department. Right. Uh, what did you do mostly during those three years? So one of the main so research, well, I did a lot of collaborations with, with the doctors in the Mayo Clinic. Um, you know, I got a position at the Mayo Clinic. I had access to their data. So we were doing a lot of different projects with them, trying to essentially help them make better decisions uh, to save patients. Uh, I started with the emergency room. I did a lot of work with their emergency room physicians, but also with some other parts of the hospital with uh, uh, transplantation department, with uh, endocrinology department. I still have a lot of projects with them I'm working on. Uh, so a lot of work with the, with the um, emergency department, but I also had, you know, reserved some time to, to think about the decision-making problems that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And I worked on a specific sort of setting where um, I wanted to, to, to develop some methods that people can use to mm -hmm. make decisions while they are facing ambiguity. And ambiguity is, again, different than um, either settings of probabilistic views where, you know, as I said, you assign exact probabilities or views that say, oh, you can use fuzzy numbers or uh, linguistic, essentially, words, you know. Uh, I move towards, you know, thinking about sort of decision making on their ambiguity and, and scenarios where there is ambiguity. And I developed some sort of um, tools to, to for people to be able to use when they are making decisions, but they are facing um, ambiguous situations. Right. Uh, now the big question, eh? how did you join Harvard? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, they had an uh, open position in, in, in my field. And uh, so I, I just uh, try to try to get a sense of whether they are interested in me or not. And they were very interested. So I applied for the open position. Uh, you, as is the usual case, you know, you give a job talk, you, you have interviews, one to one interviews, uh, they review all your documents, your publications, um, what other people think about you, what other people think about your work, uh, what other people, you know, think about your essentially uh, future abilities, potentials, things like that. Um, and, you know, they reviewed all those things. They got back to me. They interviewed me for a couple of rounds. And uh, I gave, again, talks, job talks, uh, things like that. And so I, I, I got an offer. So they were interested in, in me, I believe. So I got an offer and I, um, you know, accepted the offer. And uh, I started my uh, work here at Harvard. And I'm really happy to be here. 
uh, very great environment. Um, one of the main reasons I, I accepted here was because it gave me the ability to be closer to to policymakers, and that's where you ha you have the opportunity to uh, essentially have public impact, change the life of a lot of people. Because policymakers are essentially um, in charge of you know making policies, and policies mm -hmm. affect a lot of people. Um, and you know, yeah. so I, I realized that I can have larger impact. Uh, by affecting policies, uh, by trying to bring some of this OR optimization tools to how policies are made uh, and how we try to affect the life of a lot of right. people. Right, yeah. We're going to get back to that shortly. Uh, how long did it take the entire process? Yeah, it's a, usually a year. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a year process. You know, you, you have to submit all the documents they want and um, all the, you know, uh, interviews, job talks, um, you know, several round of interview, um, one to one meetings, job talks again, it, it takes it takes a long time. Yeah. But, yeah. Can you talk about the quality of mind aspect that is highly yeah. appreciated at Harvard? Yeah, so one of the criteria that Harvard um, has for for promotion, but also for hiring uh, is which is different than most other universities. You know, things that are common are research, publication, service. These things are, you know, almost all all universities follow this criteria. But one of the things that Harvard has is is called quality of mind. And this is essentially to assess the person a little bit outside his own research, uh, own sort of service, and uh, own teaching. So just to to, to get a sense of is that person a scholar or not, right? Mm -hmm. So the, we, we talked a little bit about the definition yeah. of, of being a scholar and uh, what is the quality of uh, the way that person thinks? Uh, it, does he have the ability to, to affect, you know, multiple areas? Uh, is he knowledgeable about, you know, different things? So, you know, people that have written, you know, um, highly impactful books that, you know, have been able to to affect multiple areas. So they are, you know, sort of considered, um, they get high scores on those things. Mm -hmm. But that's a, a, um, a criteria that Harvard uses, but uh, a lot of other universities don't. Yeah, so it, it goes beyond publications, uh, yeah, teaching outside, and all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's in addition to, you know, publications, research, uh, teaching, service, you, you know, um, the other the other criteria that universities have and Harvard has too is sort of the institutional commitment is how much you're doing for the institution, not just for your own department, but, but for institution. Like, you know, I'm asked, what am I doing to contribute to Harvard as, mm -hmm. as, uh, as a you know, university, not just in my own school or department, but at, to Harvard environment and things like that. But this quality of mind, again, is, is another factor that Harvard has been using and is still using. Right. Uh, you are in one of the most famous uh, universities in the entire world. And how did your life change after joining Harvard? Yeah, so one thing I want to, I mean, I, I, I want to mention is that, you know, for people to know, and it's, and it's important is that, you know, you, if you're doing good research, you can be anywhere, right? So you can be in unknown universities and do really good research. We already have a lot of good people in all universities. Uh, so sometimes I want to emphasize this, and sometimes people think that, like, you know, only people that are in top universities are doing good job. Definitely not. Uh, we have, you know, top researchers all over in all universities. So um, that is, uh, you know, a sort of a myth that I want to just, you know, clarify. Yeah, sure. Again, you, you, you can be anywhere and do really good, in, impactful research. Uh, but obviously, you know, it makes it easier when you are in, you know, a, a top university because you have access to, you know, um, sometimes really good uh, students sometimes really good resources. Um, you hear, you know, I have I'm, I'm talking to really well known and really influential people in different fields. You know, a lot of my colleagues are Nobel Prize winner economists or, or you know, other people who who have had really great influence in their work. So um, it, it can make it easier uh, from some aspects. And uh, but also it, it brings more on your shoulder. So you mm -hmm. become you get more responsibilities, you know, uh, you get 
request for interviews. Yeah. You get requests <laughs> from, you know, from newspapers to write something for them. For you know, uh, you get a lot of a lot of requests that mm -hmm. you know are demanding on your time more than when you are you know uh not other university and another thing that is on your shoulder is that like you know that you have uh, a larger microphone and you're responsible to using that microphone larger microphone uh in a good way yeah absolutely right? yeah, so, yeah. Um, i have to i have to do the things that i can make sure i'm using that larger microphone to have better influence to to make the world a better place yeah yeah that's that's very impressive too uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm really glad that you 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 share uh, your views on, on this. You no, know, you seem to be very down to earth, despite the fact you were in a highly prestigious university. And how would you describe the, the everyday life at Harvard? Yeah, so it's, uh, f I mean, for me, it's it's a lot of learning opportunities. Uh, you know, you you learn from very uh, impressive people. You are, um, you know have really good colleagues that ca can teach you a lot of different things. Um, so life is busy, obviously, for a lot of people, in including me. Uh, a lot of things, again, uh, on our shoulder. But, uh, you know, from a learning perspective, I think it's amazing because, uh, you know, always there are seminars in all different fields, top seminars, top people coming, giving talks. Uh, you know, you're teaching, uh, you can ask anybody to come and give, you know, a, a lecture uh, for you. People are always, you know, happy to go to Harvard and mm -hmm. give a lecture. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a very interesting uh, environment um, because, you know, you have a lot of opportunities. Right. Uh, do you want to talk uh, about your public impact analytics science lab? and your recent research activities involving OR and machine learning in the context of healthcare and public policy. Yeah, absolutely. So I, the, the lab that I um, founded and, and, and direct uh, is, again, the, the mission is to try to use all the analytic tools that are out there and advance them also uh, from OR, statistics, computer science, you know, machine learning and AI fields, uh, related fields. Uh, try to have an impact, try to solve problems that are, I call them societal problems. Um, and specifically right now, my my lab is focusing on, on, on healthcare and try to add, you know, solve a lot of problems that we have in the US in, in healthcare. We are working with a lot of different hospitals with Mass General Hospital. I have projects going on with Mayo Clinic. As I said, I have a lot of projects going on. I am collaborating with other labs at Harvard. Um, to use that, you know, some of them are using these techniques or advancing these techniques. Um, and with some other organizations outside Harvard, we are trying to collaborate to essentially bring um, these um, analytical tools uh, together to have, you know, public impact. Right. Uh, can you be more specific about uh, the machine learning tools you, you've been using? Yeah, so I teach a large class here at Harvard on sort of uh, it's called machine learning and big data analytics, where we review machine learning techniques, but we also cover their applications that I, I, that can have, you know, uh, public impact. Um, and so we cover a lot of cases on how these techniques can be used to solve, you know, societal problems and things like that. My main work, as I said, are, are on healthcare. We are trying to save lives, trying to improve how hospitals make decisions, how um, healthcare policies are made. Uh, we are using the, all these techniques for different things in terms of like COVID, for instance, we use these techniques to help. I, I worked a little bit with the government of Bahrain trying to help them um, um, make better policies in terms of COVID. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of applications that are out there that you can have public impact position. Right. Uh, but Techniques such as uh, reinforcement learning, uh, sequential yeah, decision making. Of, yeah. yeah, so uh, reinforcement learning is one of the main things that my postdocs and uh, my uh, PhD students uh, have been working on, um, specifically in recent years. And so we, uh, these are all related to uh, dynamic decision making scenarios where you have to make decisions. But as we know, uh, the world is not static; uh, things change. Um, you know, if the physicians are making decisions for, for patients, 
you know, the state of the patient changes, their health condition changes. So how should, you know, uh, how should the doctors make decisions? So we are using a lot of reinforcement learning techniques, but they are um, a little bit also outside reinforcement learning, I would say, in the mm -hmm. sense that they are, you know, you need to have uh, sort of causal understanding of things. So we are combining um, essentially three areas, which is, you know, reinforcement learning, dynamic decision making and dynamic causal inference. Because, you know, once you come up with a new policy, uh, a new rule, a new sets of rules or a new policy, then you have to have the ability to essentially estimate the causal impact. How would they change the world or the environment that you are studying it if it wasn't used in practice, right? So that's a causal question. And we are combining this reinforcement learning techniques that are out there. A lot of times they are used for uh, prediction only, mm -hmm. you know, but we are using it mainly for, for causal inference, trying to uh, see how they can be used for causal inference in dynamic scenarios. And specifically, a lot of the scenarios that I'm talking about, you have things that are, you know, uh, hidden to you. So you might have, you know, hidden confounders or other variables that are not collected in the data sets. So you have a data set that you are trying to learn from. The data sets are usually observational in the sense that they are not, you know, it's not a randomized controlled trial or something like that mm -hmm. where things are randomized. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot of things can be going on in them. There might be, you know, um, confounders that are not in your data set. Uh, and when you are coming up with causal impact of things, you have to, you know, control for them, you have to adjust for them, but it's, it's definitely not easy mm -hmm. to do. And so we are advancing a little bit the theory um, in that domain, but are, we are trying to also, um, you know, do it in a way that we can actually help hospitals and help practice uh, to gain better, you know, to, to, to essentially mm -hmm. implement better policies. Yeah. And what's your take on the OR and machine learning debate? Yeah, I think, in, you know, I, I, I looked at them as, as compliments and, um, you know, the broader area, which to me is analytics, includes both of them, includes OR, it includes uh, machine learning, it includes also, uh, you know, a lot of uh, statist statistics and, and computer science, you know, algorithms that are outside even like, you know, machine learning and AI. Uh, but I think to me, what is interesting is, is is putting them together, joining forces, because that's where I think, you know, you can have an impact. And if you want to have real impact, I think you can't, you can't just, you know, ignore the possibilities of different tools that are available, right? So, you know, yes, you have machine learning tools, but they have, you know, limitations, like a lot of them are being used, for instance, for, for uh, prediction, and they are not that much useful if you want to do, you know, causal uh, inference. When it comes to dynamic settings that I'm saying, you know, these techniques uh, are, all of them have limitations. And so you have to combine it with other things, you know, statisticians have been able to develop new tools. And so, and, you know, to me, what is interesting is is to to join forces and join forces in a way that you can have public impact. Yeah. That's 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 very interesting, and uh, thank you for sharing your views. Uh, I agree with them. Um, you have papers not only in OR journals but also in medical journals. Can you share your views on the importance of publishing articles in journals from other fields? Yeah. So I, you know, one of the ad advice I have always for my for my students is that if you want to have an impact, you have to publish in the domain journals as well. And this is because, you know, for me, you know, working on healthcare, if I want the physicians to actually read my work or policymakers to read my work, uh, you know, I have to I have to publish in journals that they will read, right? So they may not come to OR and read an OR paper because that's not their language, that's not their area. Uh, you have to be able to publish in their journals and uh, also show that you have the domain knowledge to do that, right? So um, I believe it's very important and it doesn't matter. I'm, just gave you an example about healthcare, but you know, suppose you're working on energy, you have to publish in energy journals. Uh, if you're working on uh, education, you have to be able to publish in education journals, trying to, you know, communicate to people who read those journals. And I think it is important because it will help you to come out of out of the box, mm -hmm. uh, to to think out of the box, and to be able to. Uh, 
see things from a different view, you mm -hmm. know, because you, if you are in OR, for instance, you know how OR people think, yeah, right, uh, and it's easier for you to publish mm -hmm. in OR. I can tell you, some people think, oh, you know, it's it's easy to publish in in medical journals. Not at all. I mean, <laughs> you have to learn a lot of things. You have to learn the language. You have to know what you know is important for for them. Uh, you know, you get a lot of rejections from uh, those journals more than you get from your own journals. Yeah, and and, and it's natural because yeah, you know, I've been through that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, it's it's natural <laughs> to know your field and to be able to publish in your field. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, but when you go outside, it, it becomes challenging. But I think it's very important to do that. Yeah, and if someone wants to study with you or collaborate with you, uh, what are your recommendations? Yeah, so we have, you know, we are always looking for, for um, you know, uh, people to join in my, to my lab and to my research group. Uh, we have multiple sort of avenues for that to happen. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I, we have postdoc opportunities and on my website I have, you know, uh, open positions for, for postdoc uh, positions uh, for people to join to my lab and to our research centers. Um, but also for PhD students, you know, they can apply to our PhD programs. The type of things we look is similar to what other universities are looking for. Uh, typically what matters is your, uh, you know, uh, CV, your letters, uh, recommendation letters, your grades, your, um, again, your experience, if you have experience in terms of either research or uh, industry experience. Uh, GRES scores and TOEFL scores. Now we are at Harvard. We are trying to lift them, um, and so you know we are not again requiring GRES scores from uh, last year, starting last year. Uh, but again, we need to get a sense that you know you're you're fluent in English. So there's a combination of all of them. And as I said, I started the conversation with you earlier mm -hmm. about this multi-criteria decision making and, and group decision making. So this is the same scenario where we have multiple criteria and there's a group. It's really that, you know, a person would say, you know, uh, I want this person and this person should be admitted. It's, it's a group view mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. And so I recommend all those people to try to improve everything as much as they can. The recommendation letters again research experience um grades if they can you know things like that right yeah uh, as a scholar uh what did you learn from the past uh one one and a half years or so or even more uh you know this covid pandemic and all that uh, what are your views regarding this matter yeah, so as you know, COVID has been you know tough for for all, a lot of people. It brought um, some opportunities for us to rethink uh, some of the you know some of the things we, we we thought. I mean, it's just amazing when you think that uh, a small <laughs> sort of uh, species, which is a virus, right, yeah. can yeah. can change the life of people. Uh, and you would think, well, we are in 2021 or 2020. Uh, that shouldn't have happened, but you know, it, it reminds us that how, first of all, how small we are in the world, right? Mm -hmm. That a small species can can change all of our lives, can can take the lives of, unfortunately, a lot of people and things like that. So, first of all, a reminder that you know, uh, we are small creatures still, and that you know, um, we have to be able to develop scientific methods uh, that can prevent us from these things happening. But also, um, I think it brought other perspectives in the sense that, you know, I always say the, the uh, it's, it's a famous quote that says, you know, the most, uh, the, the, the species that can survive are the, not the smartest people, they are the most adaptive yeah. species, right? So adaptivity, I think here is very important. And so we all of us try to adapt to the new situation, right, for us was you know we, we had to change our courses to do online and then you know change it back to teaching in person changing in teaching in masks uh, personal lives you know were, were all affected a lot of people uh, per their personal lives were affected and it reminded us that we need to be adaptive as well so i think both in in the sense that we are small we need to be more adaptive and that we need to develop more scientific tools scientific methods to prevent these things happening again, you know, 
uh, from the sp Spanish influence or without, you know, we learned how to deal with pandemics, but see, no, uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we have to learn more. Yeah. Uh, so right now there must be a young Surush in Iran or in other part of the world dreaming of studying or even working in Harvard. Do you have a message or any piece of advice to these brilliant young minds out there? Absolutely, yeah. I think you, you know one of one of the main things I would recommend is is learning, and it is such an important thing. You know, uh, just learn and learn and learn. Uh, maybe thinking about you know being in, in top universities shouldn't be on top of your mind, but learning should be. And um, you know, I always tell my students never graduate from being a student. I mean, graduate, but never graduate from being a student. Stay student, uh, learn as much as you can. Even when you're a faculty member, I mean, you have to have the ability to learn. You have to be keen to learn. And uh, learning, I think, is, is, is very important. So that's what I suggest people focus on rather than thinking about, OK, am I going to be in this university and that university? It, these are important. I'm not saying these are not important because they, they affect your life. Uh, I mean, resources in top universities are much better, typically, than lower universities. And you know, you would get more resources to do more impactful research, of course. But still, you know, if you are not in top university, you can do that if you, ha if you have the ability to learn, uh, if you have the ability to think about what is important to do and what is not important to do. Okay, so that's something that people miss is that you know, hard working is, is required, learning is required, um, obviously, but also learning what to work on. Uh, that's another thing that I would recommend people to think about. Yeah, and uh, any side skills you think uh, are really, really important for one to develop? Yeah, I, I, you know, for instance, when I go back to, let's say, 10 years ago and things like that, I, the things that I now realize how, how important they are, and I didn't probably pay attention to them, probably still not paying enough <laughs> attention to them. Uh, one of the things is, is sort of networking and, and trying to um, have a good network of people that you can talk to, you can collaborate with. Um, and people who can, who know your work and who can, you know, um, give you advice to do better work. You know, I think networking is, um, is, is very important uh, in the US and it's one of the things that I never thought of it, right? So I was like, always like, okay, so I'm gonna do my job and I gotta be, you know, write the best paper that I can. Uh, these are all good, but beyond them, you need to have the ability to, to to get to know people, work with them, collaborate with them, have people that know you, uh, recommend you for different things, or advise you for for eternities. Uh, so having this network of people who you can learn from them, uh, it allows you to become a better person uh, and a more effective researcher because you know a lot of things they have gone through, and um, if you have the ability to learn from them, they will, you know, give you really um, good advice. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember one thing, uh, I have a great uncle, the uncle of my mom, uh, he was a medical doctor and he went to Harvard in somewhere in the late 30s, 1930s or wow. soon after the war in the 1940s to, for higher studies and he influenced uh, a lot of uh, other family members including my mom and um, of course I've been influenced by her, she's a, she's a uh, scholar, uh, maybe not according to your definition, maybe, but she has a PhD and all that. So uh, you can see that, you know, when one person from your field or environment take a huge step, it can have a huge influence in other people that are uh, uh, living with them or, you know, close people. So uh, I think you're, you're a person that can, can really do uh, a lot of things to our field and to other uh, researchers, not only from Iran, but elsewhere. So like talking to you has been really, really uh, inspiring. Thank and you. Uh, I don't know how to thank you, Sorush. I'm very grateful for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule and thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, thank you. Right, so I, I hope to meet you in person at some point and maybe one day visit Harvard. Yeah.
Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, please come. <laughs> yeah. So once again, thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks. Ciao.